I want you to open the word of the Lord with me to a passage of scripture that I'm certain is very familiar to most of the people that are under this pavilion tonight. It's found in the book of Matthew, the 25th chapter of the book of Matthew in the first verse. I just want to read the first 10 verses that are recorded here. And by way of explanation, you need to know that the chapter headings were arbitrarily put there by the translators. And what Jesus said in Matthew 25 is really just a continuation of all the things that he was saying in the 24th chapter. If you're familiar with the 24th chapter of Matthew, you know that he was describing end time events and he was describing last day conditions. And he was telling them, this is what we are to watch for. And when we see all these things begin to come to pass, we're to look up and lift up our head for our redemption is drawing nigh. But he said something that is very, very poignant and it puts everything in proper perspective as he explained in Matthew 25 what we were to do in response to these end time signs. He said this in the first verse, then, everybody say it with me, then. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, and they took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And please focus with me on the tenth verse. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. From this passage tonight, for a few minutes, I want to minister to you about the eternal dangers of ignoring the last warning. Would you bow your heads with me for prayer? Father, we thank you for the anointing of your spirit that has been present here throughout this entire week for the glory of God that came down under this pavilion last night and the people that responded by stepping to the altar and there they found you as Savior and Lord. We ask my Father for greater things to happen tonight as more and more will come forward to, see, to receive you as Savior and to be delivered and set free from every bondage. I pray today for that anointing that makes the preach word of God effective. Do touch us tonight, Lord God, that we shall stand before your people and minister as your oracle that you in all things may be glorified and we give you praise for breakthroughs and victories and for deliverances that will happen in this place tonight and that no one will leave like they came, but all shall be edified and lifted up and encouraged and empowered by the Holy Ghost of God. And we give you praise for all of this that you accomplish in Jesus' name. And everybody said together, Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. You may be seated in his presence. The signs that Jesus revealed as indicators of his coming, that his coming was near, were really intended to be more than just forecast of end time events. All of the 20, 21 signs that he enumerated in Matthew 24 are actually a warning to both the saved and to the unsaved to be ready for his return or face the perils of being left behind. The parable that Jesus gave at the end of his description of end time events emphasized the need to be ready and never to take our salvation or our relationship with him for granted. The Lord's parable of the five wise and the five foolish virgins revealed the measures that must be taken to be prepared for his coming. We must first of all be fully awake from spiritual slumber. Then we are required to trim the lamps and fill the empty vessels with fresh oil to fuel the flame that penetrates the darkness of the midnight hour. Trimming the lamps means to cut away the dead issues that prevents a new fire from igniting so that even a greater light can shine as the bridegroom approaches. To put it bluntly, there are professing Christians who must stop defending their sin and immediately repent of it to be ready for the Lord's return. You see, 
The word of God states this in Proverbs 28 and 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. And then it's written again in Isaiah 30 and 1. Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, and that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. I want you to understand tonight that God has not changed his mind about sin, despite all the false doctrines that are now attempting to justify ungodly lifestyles. The scripture reads it very clearly in Galatians 5 and 19 where there is a comprehensive list of sins that inevitably bring destruction and it's unequivocally written, they that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Let me be as clear and as blunt with you as I possibly can tonight. If a person wants to be ready for the coming of the Lord, they have to get the sin out of their life, the beer out of their refrigerator, the porn off of their computer, the drugs out of their house, the lust out of their heart, the greed out of their spirit, the hate out of their soul, the profanity out of their mouth, the wickedness out of their lifestyle, and fill the emptiness with the love of God shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. This is what Jesus meant when he said, trim the lamps. The sleeping virgins of the Lord's parable were awakened by a cry in the distance, behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. And that unmistakable shout was more than a wake-up call. It was meant to be their last warning. To ignore or diminish the seriousness of the call meant that a person would be excluded from the marriage supper and miss the appearance of the bridegroom. The Lord Jesus spoke this parable to underscore the horrible possibility and distinct danger of ignoring the final warning. In spite of the multitude of signs that literally dominated our times, warning us that judgment is coming and tribulation is coming and Jesus is coming, the warning signs are being ignored as people close their eyes to the obvious and deafen their ears to the call. The warnings have been loud and long. But I want to tell you tonight that today we are approaching the moment when God is issuing his final warnings. Jesus told of mysterious diseases. He called it pestilence. And if you'll do any research on that word in the original Greek, you'll discover that he's talking about mysterious illnesses. Illnesses and diseases that do not come from nature. Illnesses and diseases that come from mysterious sources. He said that mysterious diseases would plague the last days. And the entire world has been a reluctant witness to the accuracy of his word during these last two years of pandemic. Now, the so-called health experts are talking about variants and sub-variants like Delta and Omicron and B4 and B5 and monkeypox. Dr. Fauci recently said that the virus will be with us forever and more and more shots will be required. And the corrupt WHO, the World Health Organization, is calling for more lockdowns and mask mandates to return this fall. Well, while they are telling people that we've got reason to be afraid and reason to be fearful because more disease is coming I have an answer to all of the bad news that they have been propagating he that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty I'll say of the Lord he's my refuge and my fortress and my God and in him will I trust and surely he shall deliver thee from the noise and pestilence he said that no plague will come nigh your dwelling. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. You have just received your inoculation from every disease and sickness that the devil would bring our way. Come on and give the Lord praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah somebody and say I'm a believer my name is in the Lamb's book of life I've got a right to a healthy body I've got a right to a healthy mind I've got a right to a healthy soul I've got a right to an abundant life I'm an heir and a joint heir with Christ <laughs> hallelujah hallelujah since the advent of the virus and the so-called vaccines, there's a new medical phenomenon that has developed, and it's called SADS, 
appropriately called SADS. That's an acronym that stands for Sudden Adult Death Syndrome. This is death from conditions that can't be diagnosed. And healthy young people are dying suddenly. Since the rollout of the vaccines, almost 50,000 people under the age of 40 have dropped dead for no apparent reason. Mysterious diseases causing mysterious deaths is not just a quirk of nature, it's a warning sign that the midnight of midnights is approaching. The Lord also spoke of wars and rumors of wars. And now 40 nations are embroiled in military conflicts and the globe is on the precipice of World War III. The current administration is playing a dangerous game with Russia by arming the Ukraine with sophisticated weapons. Now listen, the Russian high command responded by threatening to launch tactical nuclear weapons against those nations which oppose its war in Ukraine. A Russian general and member of the country's legislature said that the Russian military is ready for a potentially massive conflict with NATO countries, the United States being among them. On state-owned Russian television, General Andrei Gurkilov said Russia is preparing for everything, including a big, colossal war with NATO, should the conflict in Ukraine escalate. And the moderator of that program plainly stated that the war could lead to a potential nuclear conflict. Just a few days ago, Mr. Putin, the leader of Russia, met with the president of Turkey in Iran with the Ayatollahs to plot strategy for widening the war in Ukraine. Russia, Iran, and Turkey are the three principal nations mentioned in Ezekiel's prophecy of a Russian invasion of Israel. The scripture says that those nations are going to join together and strike Israel during the first part of the coming seven-year tribulation. And now we are witnesses to the fact that these leaders are meeting together to plot strategy. Ezekiel prophesied that Russia will think an evil thought and say, I'll go to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to the people that are at rest to take a spoil and to take a prey. You see, Iran will have a nuclear weapon capable of striking Israel within a few days. And the clock is now ticking down on Ezekiel's prophecy. But before Russia and its allies come like a storm to cover the land, a trumpet is going to sound. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive, everybody that's alive, we which are alive and yet remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and forever shall we be with him. It's significant. It's significant that when the Apostle Paul received the revelation of that pre-tribulation rapture that he told the church, wherefore comfort one another with these words. There is no comfort in telling me that I'm going to have to go through more trouble and more trial. There's no comfort in telling me that we've got to be here when a fourth of the world's population is destroyed with a matter of years. There is no comfort in what the scripture says is going to happen during tribulation times. But the scripture said in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 9, God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. All the things that are listed in Revelation about tribulation times are not meant for the church. God not down in intend for any blood washed believer to be here when any of that transpires. He has provided a way of our escape and it's comforting to me that when I turn on the television set and hear about wars and rumors of wars I can say surely the Lord's coming. When I can hear about earthquakes in divers places it lets me know that the coming of the Lord is near that is even at the door. I came to bring some comfort to somebody that's despondent, somebody that's discouraged. Your battle's soon gonna be over. Your weary bones are going to be changed in the moment of a twinkling of an eye. I feel the comfort of the Holy Ghost of God that there is a trumpet soon to sound. Brother, I didn't think you was ever going to get here. Thank God that you made it. Hallelujah. 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 
Ezekiel 38 tells us about the Russian invasion of Israel, but it also tells us how God's going to defeat it. There's going to be nations, including our own, that are going to protest it, but they're not really going to get involved in it. But the Lord said, when they come to the mountains of Israel, when they touch my land, my fury is going to come up in my face. And he said, there's going to be a great shaking in the land of Israel. And he said that he was going to destroy the invading army until only one-sixth of it is going to be left there is going to be such a complete miraculous victory in the Mideast that the headlines of the world's newspapers is going to say something supernatural has happened in the Israel it happened in the Mideast God is going to defend his land God is going to defend his covenant people God is not going to let the enemy and the forces of darkness destroy what he says is mine and all the nations of the earth are going to know that he is the Lord. Well, I want you to know that battle hasn't begun yet, but there's a battle going on right now. There's a battle for your family, and there's a battle for your health, and there's a battle for your peace, and there's a battle for your joy, but the battle is not ours. The battle is the Lord. hands together and give the Lord one more mighty praise. Oh, 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 Lord. You can be seated. But all of that is taking place not just to tell the church that Jesus is coming soon, but to tell the world it's time to take warning. In a poll conducted earlier this year by the prestigious firm McLaughlin & Associates, it was found that 40% of all Americans, 40%, believe the Russian invasion of Ukraine is a biblical sign of the prophesied last days. And the poll also revealed that 4 in 10 Americans believe that the COVID pandemic is a biblical end time sign about the soon return of the Lord. But despite the convincing evidence that prophecy is being fulfilled, the sad, tragic fact is that the overall attitude to the Word of God has not changed because only 20% of Americans, which includes professing Christians, believe that this Bible is the literal Word of God. And I ask you today, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? The pandemic was not enough to awaken people to righteousness. It was not enough to humble people before God and cause them to repent. Despite all that is happening, People aren't changing their mind. The shaking of the past two years and the escalating war in Europe has not been enough to spark a nationwide revival and produce a return to the one true God of the Bible. The unrepentant attitude that grips the nation can only mean one thing, that even more severe shakings are on the way. The signs of the times just keep coming, and the world right now is getting its final warning. The Holy Ghost informed the Apostle John of an unprecedented economic system where marks and numbers would replace currency, gold and silver, and no one would be permitted to buy or sell unless marked in the forehead or hand. And now the nations are implementing the plan of the World Economic Forum to do exactly what the Word of God said would happen in the last days. The Netherlands and Sweden are already implementing such a system. Last year, the British-Polish firm Walton Moore became the first company to offer implantable payment chips placed in the hands of users. The company said, quote, the implant can be used to pay for a drink on the beach in Rio, a coffee in New York, a haircut in Paris, or at your local grocery store. It can be used wherever contactless payments are accepted. This chip weighs less than a gram and is little bigger than a grain of rice. It's comprised of a tiny microchip and an antenna encased in biopolymer, and it doesn't require a battery or a power source. And Klaus Schwab, who is the leader of the World Economic Forum, said this, quote, human beings will soon receive a chip in their body in order to merge them with the digital world, end of quote. Just compare what he said. 
to what's written in Revelation chapter 13. When a world ruler called the Antichrist will cause all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their forehead or their hand, and that no man might buy or sell, save he had the mark or the number of his name. Are you hearing me today? We are very close to the implementation of that system. But there is a restrainer that is active in the world right now that is keeping the forces of Antichrist from reaching their goal. I'm showing you a mystery, my dear friend. It's written in the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that he that now hinders will hinder until he be taken out of that way. I want you to raise your hand right now to the Lord because I'm doing this for a special purpose. You do not know how powerful you are in the scheme of last day events. If you are blood washed, if you are spirit filled, if your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, if you have put on the whole armor of God, you have the power to stand against the wiles of the devil. You today are that great Holy Spirit restraining force that is keeping back the forces of darkness. You've got power to put the devil under your feet. You can tread on serpents, on scorpions, and have power over all the power of the enemy. You do not listen to the adversary as he tries to belittle you and belittle your faith. He is a liar and he is the father of it. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost and greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Everything about you speaks of power. You've got power in your hands to lay on the sick and they will recover. You've got power in your spirit to pray that effectual first and prayer of a righteous man that availeth much. We are not a weak church. We are the glorious church and we have the power to tear down the strongholds of the enemy. Make the devil real mad and put your hands together one more time and bless the Lord. Whoa. Hallelujah. Be seated. He taught him a hushah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I feel the confirming power of the Holy Ghost in this place. There's an anointing right now that destroys every yoke of bondage. Somebody's putting into action those weapons which are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of stone. Just in case somebody is forgotten, just take them by the hand. Go to two or three people and say, greater is he that's in us. 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 If two of us shall agree upon the earth touching any one thing that we shall ask, it'll be done for us by our Father which is in heaven. Woo! Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Hallelujah. Sit down, you're messing with me tonight. I'm just about to preach. Oh, ho, ho. The sea, the seas are warmer than usual. And this warm water is producing the conditions that Jesus said would cause the sea and the waves to roar. And I want to be very clear tonight it's not man's carbon footprint that is causing all the strange phenomena in the weather. But it's last day sin on a planet that was never designed to tolerate perversions and abominations. The word of God tells us in Romans 8 and 22 that the upheaval of nature is, the, is the, really the earth groaning and travailing in pain in anticipation of the coming redemption. You see, science can tell us the what, but it cannot tell us the why. Only the Word of God can explain the perplexing state of the climate. The mega droughts in the West and the extreme weather in the East is really a warning that things are going to get worse. Jesus spoke of earthquakes in unexpected places. And today, not only are old fault lines active and showing signs of major quakes, but new fault lines are constantly appearing. The United States has potentially 161 active volcanoes. And four are in various stages of eruption right now. The world has 1,500 volcanoes that are awakening after centuries of inactivity. And there's no agency that can give a definitive answer for this sudden geological phenomenon. 
But the word of God reveals that earthquakes and volcanic eruptions will increase during the last days. The Bible said in Isaiah 24 and 20, The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a cottage, and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. David got a glimpse of end time volcanoes erupting and he wrote in the 104th Psalm in the 32nd verse, He looketh on the earth and it trembleth. He toucheth the hills and they smoke. In August 2020, an underwater volcano, volcano in Antarctica, which has been silent for centuries, suddenly roared back to life. Seismologists recorded 85,000 earthquakes at that volcano site and they said, this is the largest seismic unrest ever recorded. Unprecedented events are happening at a rapid rate in every sector of the earth's existence. The world is witnessing right now things in nature, things in the governments, things in the culture, in the society, in politics, and in religion that have never happened before. There's unprecedented lawlessness, the breakdown of morality, the surge of violence, drug addiction, unheard of sexual perversions, unprecedented mockery and blasphemy and unmatched evil in medically driven genocide. The world is blind and deaf to the warning signs. But he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying unto the church. We will not conclude these last days passive and defeated with our hands folded in our lap, completely inactive to the assaults of the adversary upon us. The end time church is about to stand up. It's about to rise up. Darkness is covering the earth and gross darkness the people. But the glory of the Lord shall be seen upon you. Oh, Lord, hallelujah, hallelujah. For those who heed the warning signs of God's immutable word, there is light in these dark times. Somebody's going to help me preach tonight. When I point at you, you say amen. When I point at you, you say hallelujah. When I point at you, you get up and run. When I point at you, you jump a pew. Are you with me tonight? I don't know what the Lord's going to lead you to do, but I know this, you're just not going to sit there. Let's try this again. Need some backup on the organ. You got me? All right, you got it? Got it? Got my back. All right, let's go. All right. For those who heed the warnings of God's immutable word, there is light in these dark times. There is peace in these days of unprecedented evil. There's victory in the midst of widespread defeat. There's shelter from the raging chaos. There's stability in the midst of global confusion. There's sanity in a world gone crazy. Whoa. You did that real well. Here's, here's the second installment. Just sit down. We're going to try this again. This word that I'm preaching from tonight can't be destroyed by a cancel culture. It can't be consumed by tyrants. It can't be choked out by tradition. It can't be corrupted by infidels. It's God's word. It's the sword of the spirit. It's a fire shut up in our bones. It's a hammer to break down strongholds. It's a lamp unto our feet. It's a light unto our path. It's milk that strengthens. It's water that quenches. It's sweet honey in the honeycomb. Oh, oh, oh. Hallelujah. Shanamahotanadamikedios. Its authority is final. Its wisdom is peerless. Its truth is absolute. It's the lifeline to pull us out of the pit. It's the anchor that keeps us steadfast in the storms. Come on and give God praise for his immutable, unchanging, unending word. Hallelujah. Praise. I've been waiting for that. Be seated, please. But my concern tonight is for people who have rejected their last warning. The scriptures make it very clear that the Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And he will go to great lengths to save the lost. 
He'll surround a person with multiple warnings and opportunities to be saved from the wrath that's coming. His spirit will attempt to awaken a person's conscience and penetrate their heart with a message that today is your day of salvation and now is your appointed time. He will disrupt a person's sleep with dreams to turn them around from the direction that their life is taking. He will orchestrate events to bring a person to a place where they can hear the gospel, be convicted of sin, and respond to him at the altar of prayer. Unknowingly to the unsaved, he'll cause them to channel flip on their television to a gospel station where something is being said that will prick their heart. At other times, he will direct people to put gospel literature in unexpected places to attract someone to read its life-giving message. The Holy Spirit will intervene in countless close calls to spare someone from certain death and give them another opportunity to call on his name. He will work on a person's intellect so that they will recognize that the current upheaval of nature and the unprecedented weather and unparalleled solar activity and the deterioration of society and an unstoppable trend toward global government are not flukes of nature or history, but biblically prophesied signs to tell an unsuspecting world the calamity of unimaginable proportions is coming and he is the only way of escape. The Holy Spirit just never stops reaching out to the lost, the backslidden, the cold and indifferent, the lukewarm, the fence rider, the rebellious, the disobedient, and the numberless prodigals who have left Father's house to indulge in the slop buckets of the world's hog pens. He sends preacher after preacher, witness after witness, altar call after altar call, until there comes a time when the last warning is issued. Then there are no more preachers. No more invitations, no more altar calls, but just a fearful looking for of judgment that will devour the adversaries. God sends warnings of one kind or another to everyone who is not right with him. Warnings come to individuals. Warnings are sent to regions and cities. Warnings are issued to entire nations and to the whole world. He speaks through his word, through anointed ministers, through dreams and visions, by the tug of his spirit in the heart. He issues wake-up calls and circumstances. He is alarm sounding in wars and rumors of wars and famines and mysterious diseases and earthquakes shaking every continent. Nations arming for nuclear war in the midst. East, Jerusalem compassed about with armies and the advent of global government, emerging civil unrest and technology that can control all commerce with an implanted chip instead of a currency. I wonder tonight with all of these signs of warnings why we are not seeing multitudes of people come to the altar of prayer. Heaven has been sending urgent alert notices to this generation for a long time. But we are quickly approaching the moment when God will send his final warning. A final warning always comes at the end of a long period when God has attempted to get someone's attention and turn them around. After years of sending prophets to backslidden Judah with a message to return to God before destruction came, the Lord sent this last word to Jeremiah. You can read it for yourself in Jeremiah 7 and 13. He said, I spake unto you, rising up early and speaking, But you heard not, and I called you, but you answered not. Then the Lord told them that the judgment which had been delayed on their guilty land would be delayed no longer and instructed the prophet Jeremiah. He said this, Therefore pray not thou for this people, neither lift up cry nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. Listen, it's a sobering thing. When the God of heaven, the Lord of mercy, the gracious king says to his servants, don't pray about them anymore. Don't mention their name to me anymore. It's too late. They've had their opportunities. I gave them time and now they're beyond hope. I've warned them enough. The apostle John emphasized the duty and the power and the privilege of prayer in all of his writings. But the Holy Spirit said something startling to him. And to him in 1 John 5 and 16, that scripture admonishes believers to pray for those who have not committed the sin unto death. And God would move to reconcile that person to himself. But the scripture also continues to say it's useless to pray for someone whose consistent rebellion and rejection killed their conscience and made their heart so calloused that not even the tender mercies of the Holy Spirit could reach them. Such a person crossed a line 
that not even the power of prayer can bring back. Such were the people that lived in Noah's time. The condition that existed in Noah's day have surfaced again and they dominate our time. Jesus said, as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. The deplorable conditions of universal corruption and violence have risen again. In Noah's time, the power and presence of demon forces were so strong that an entire generation became Satan's ally in the war against God. Satan had gained direct control over the minds and bodies of human beings. Humanity had become so depraved that they lost all concern, all consideration, and all understanding of the one true God. People became entirely focused on bodily appetites. The imagination of the thoughts of their heart was on evil continually. Human beings had become so familiar with demons that a generation arose that could only be described as half human and half devil. Wickedness and evil were not resisted but embraced And the deformity in the soul was soon reflected in their physical features. Sin became so hideous and grotesque that it altered the genetic code. Modern genetics has shown that there are two basic causes of variations in physical characteristics among human beings, namely mutations and recombinations. There are a tremendous number of factors for different physical characteristics in a particular population. Some are latent, others are recessive. But these characteristics can be recombined in various ways to allow an almost unlimited variation in physical features. Then it is possible that mutations occur when genes respond to external influences and produce random changes in the genetic system. And I know that sounds like a lot of scientific jargon tonight, but the bottom line is this. Sin causes physical as well as spiritual deformity. In Noah's time, fallen angels were actually conducting genetic engineering to produce a generation without a conscience, just bodies with dead souls. The result was human monstrosities who were barbaric, cruel, and sadistic. That generation made the earth corrupt before God and filled the planet with violence. And the element that started earth's slide toward anarchy was compromise and accommodation. There were two groups of people that populated the planet in Noah's time, the descendants of Cain and the descendants of Seth. After Cain murdered his brother Abel, he was driven out from the rest of humanity and dwelt in a land where he fathered a wicked and perverse people. All of Cain's offspring plunged ever deeper into the depths of evil. They carried on Cain's generational curse. They were warlike, sensual, and violent. They perverted everything they touched, music, arts, and the sciences. They discovered ways of making weapons with iron and brass. They altered and defied everything that was decent and moral. They perverted the institution of marriage. They broke covenants. They committed murders and spread their vile ways throughout the earth. They built cities as centers of wickedness. But this ungodly line was kept in check by the godly descendants of Seth. Seth was the third son of Adam and Eve. Eve's spiritual insight informed her that the promised redeemer would one day come through Seth's descendants. They were people who called on the name of the Lord. And the names of the children of Seth revealed that their focus was on eternity and not on this earthly existence. The name Seth means established or appointed. His son, Mahaliel, means the light of God. Enoch was one of his descendants that means dedicated. And even Noah that means rest. Their focus was on eternity. And unlike the music of the Canaanites, they didn't glorify sensuality, but their music magnified the Lord and worshipped him. They were people of worship, people of prayer, people of praise who genuinely served the Lord. But in the passing of time, the righteous descendants of Seth began to mingle, mix, and intermarry with the ungodly Canaanites. The barrier against wickedness was gone. Righteousness was absorbed into the evil of the time. The children of Seth failed to hold the line. They eventually caved in to the pressure of their wicked culture. They progressively lowered their standards until there was no standard that existed at all. Their compromises let loose a tidal wave of iniquity that made the whole world a cesspool of perversion and vice and violence and cruelty. And Jesus said... As the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. The Apostle Paul emphasized the power of a spirit-filled church to restrain evil in 2 Thessalonians 2 and 7. That scripture said the mystery of lawlessness doth already work, but he who restrains will restrain 
until he's taken out of the way. That's our assignment. That's our mission. But we're beset with the same kind of compromise and accommodation to sin that existed in Noah's day. Jesus referred to the power of the two church to check sin when he called us salt and light. And he said this in John 20 and verse 23. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retained, they are retained. In the name of Jesus, somebody in the church get enough power, get enough anointing, get enough dedication to tell this woke culture and this woke generation, we are not going to stand for same-sex marriage. We are not going to stand for this gender confusion. We are not going to stand for abominations and perversions. We are not going to stand for the free-flowing marijuana and drugs. We are against it. We're taking our stand and we're speaking up what the word said about it. You are the restrainer. Whoever sins you retain, they are retained. But whoever sins that you remit, they are remitted. Oh, hallelujah. I wish you'd raise your hand and tell heaven tonight, we are going to hold the standard until he comes. Oh, Jesus. Just lift your hand and just for two minutes give the Lord intercession prayer. Let heaven know that we're calling on God for the salvation of our nation, for the salvation. Oh God, you've got to shake us one more time. You've got to move, Lord, in this nation just one more time. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. The sin of compromise is again dominating the righteous just as it did in Noah's time. You see, little compromises are becoming commonplace in a believer's walk with God. Little compromises, you can be seated, soon become big compromises. In areas such as lifestyle, you see, this is my last night. Everybody understand that? This is my last night. I'm going to hit you high, hit you low, turn you loose, and let you go. But as your pastor said last night, I've got to say what i got to say. Little compromises soon become big compromises in areas such as entertainment, lifestyle, and dress. What we watch, what we wear, the places we go, the way we think, the things we allow determine our status with God. Little lies soon breed bigger lies. Little sins breed bigger sins. But come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Oh, Lord. Unless we're determined, the flesh makes allowances for sin, and our heart becomes desensitized to it, and ultimately we embrace and defend it. The scripture warns in 1 Timothy 4 and 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils and speaking lies in hypocrisy. No matter what version of the Bible that you read, compromise, compromising with sin is exposed as eternally destructive. The Bible's clear when it says in Ephesians 5 and 11, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them makes absolutely no ambigu 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 ambiguous ambiguity ambiguous what i'm trying to say it's clear <laughs> Woo! it says in first thessalonians 5 and 22 abstain from all appearance of evil Just, just as in Noah's time. However, the righteous are caving in to the pressure to the culture. There were false prophets also among the people, Peter said in 2 Peter 2 and 1. And there shall be false teachers among you who privily or subtly shall bring in damnable heresies, even deny the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. 
you don't know how blessed you are to have a pastor and a church that preaches the truth that sets the captive free. Amen. Oh. Jesus gave a clear picture of the last days when he said, as the days of Noah were, and all of those grotesque sins of Noah's day are characteristics of a civilization that cannot tolerate, God can't tolerate, and it's his duty to destroy. He said, I'll destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. God was grieved at his heart. He regretted the creation of man. The language of the text reveals that he reconsidered the future of man and the world. And the Lord seriously considered destroying the planet. The Holy Spirit is grieved with consistent rebellion, consistent rejection, and consistent depravity. The scripture says in Isaiah 63 and 10, They rebelled and vexed His Holy Spirit. Therefore, He was turned to be their enemy, and He fought against them. There are levels of spiritual grief. There's a level when mercy turns to judgment and grace to retribution. And that's why the grieved Holy Spirit issued the last warning to Noah's day and said, my spirit will not always strive with man. The doomsday clock began ticking. The sands fell through the hourglass. Time started running out. The Holy Spirit was sent to reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. But his spirit will not always strive with man. The Hebrew word for strive is tremendously interesting because it means to plead and to govern. What that word means is this. God governs over the forces that are attempting to destroy the unsaved. He stands between man and destruction. He holds back everything that wants to prematurely end our life. Even though people have rejected and maligned and persisted in their own stubborn way, the Holy Spirit just keeps the powers of darkness at bay. That's his mercy. And there's a bunch of us today that can give the testimony if it had not been for the Lord on our side. But his spirit, his spirit won't always strive, won't always prevent calamity. When the Holy Spirit leaves, cataclysmic destruction always follows. He that being often reproved and hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. In God's consideration of the future of vile, sinful, belligerent man, Noah found grace. In the eyes of the Lord. Thank God for his mercy. Thank God for his grace. The grace of God instructed Noah through the spirit of the Lord. To build a boat for the saving of himself and his family. That ark that was built was 438, 438 feet long. 72.9 feet wide and 43.8 feet high. Hydronomic experts have studied the design of the ark and they concluded that it was exceedingly stable and virtually impossible to capsize. Even in a sea of gigantic waves, the ark could be tilted at any angle, just short of 90 degrees and would immediately right itself again. Furthermore, it would tend to align itself parallel with the, direc the direction of the wave advance and hardly feel any pitching at all. Noah put all of his energies and resources into constructing that ark. This could not be done half-heartedly, sporadically, or a hit-and-miss basis. And that's the attitude that we've got to have toward our relationship with Jesus. You see, that ark had to be made according to God's specification or it would not float. In the Lord's foreknowledge, he knew the storm that was coming. Noah did not, he was not able to comprehend the magnitude of the judgment that was coming. But God gave him the instructions to build an ark that would take him above every storm, above the fountains of the great deep being broken up, above every 40 days of a deluge upon the earth. And if you'll just listen to the Holy Ghost, if you'll just listen to the Spirit of God, if you'll just listen to the the word of the Lord you can survive anything that the devil throws your direction help me preach tonight tell somebody you got to get in the ark you got to get in the ark you got to get in the ark we're building an ark it's called the church Woo! 
But the most significant characteristic of that ark was that it was made waterproof by the application of pitch. The pitch made the ark resistant to decay. The Hebrew word for pitch is the word kofir, which is equivalent to kafir, which means to cover. And that's the word which is used for an atonement. In other words, the word that was used to describe that pitch that kept the ark afloat above the waters of judgment really refers to the atoning blood of Jesus. That, oh, hallelujah. The resinous substance was a representation of the blood. <laughs> hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. It's not programs that makes the church the church. And it is not attendance that makes the church the church. And it's not oratory behind the pulpit that makes the church the church. And it's not superlative teaching. Nor is it education. Nor is it theological degrees. What keeps this church afloat? What keeps this church going? Is the power of the blood of Jesus. Woo! Take two seconds and give God for the blood. Come on and praise it with me for the power of the blood. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh. In the name of Jesus, I'm hurrying to a close. During the 120 year countdown that the ark was in preparation, preachers and prophets proclaimed God's final warning. There was Enoch that said the Lord is coming with 10,000s of his saints to execute judgment on the earth. There was Lamech. He prophesied that when his son Methuselah died, the flood would come. There was Methuselah himself, who was a living sign in his generation. There was, a no, there was Noah, who was a preacher of righteousness. But in the end, with all that preaching, with 100, 120 years of preparation, only eight heeded the warning and came in. When the major calamities of history are examined, the outstanding feature of them all is that unnecessary tragedies always happen because someone didn't heed their final warning. Over a hundred years ago, the world was stunned by the sinking of the Titanic. That massive ship was the largest ship afloat in 1912. The engineers boasted that not even God can sink this ship. And so confident were the shipbuilders that the Titanic would never sink that they purposely reduced the number of lifeboats because the lifeboats detracted from the ship's appearance. There was only enough lifeboats for roughly one-third of the passengers and crew. Some of the world's wealthiest people purchased tickets for Titanic's maiden voyage from Southampton, England to New York. The rich and famous wanted to be a part of that newest wonder of the world. Titanic was designed to be the ultimate in opulence and luxury. It was built with a gymnasium, swimming pools, libraries, high-class restaurants, and opulent cabins. Three days into the voyage at 11.40 p.m., the ship struck an iceberg and sank within two and a half hours. At 2.20 a.m. in the morning, the ship broke apart and sank with over a thousand people still on board. Passengers who jumped into the icy waters died within minutes from hypothermia. Titanic was the technological marvel of its day. It was outfitted with a fairly new invention in communication, and it was called the wireless telegraph. To send a message by the tele telegrapher was equivalent to the marvel of our cell phones or iPads or email. And the cost of wiring a brief message from Titanic was equivalent to $50 of today's money. But the passengers lined up for the novelty of sending a message from the world's most famous ship. Hundreds of messages were sent. The operator, whose name was Jack Phillips, was making a bundle of money. On April the 14th, he had a pile of messages to send out, but he kept getting interrupted. Some other nameless operator in a ship in the North Atlantic kept sending him the same urgent message about an iceberg in Titanic's path. Jack Phillips first ignored the transmissions, and then when they kept coming, he became irritated and frustrated and tapped out six words to the unknown radio operator. His reply to the repeated warnings was this, Shut up! Shut up! I'm busy. Jack Phillips, exhausted from a lucrative day, turned off the radio receiver and went to bed. He dismissed the warnings of an iceberg as the exaggerated claims of an unduly alarmed radio operator. But within less than two hours, he was awakened by the alarms of a sinking ship. He died 
in the icy waters of the Atlantic that night because he was just too busy to be interrupted by an urgent warning from an unknown operator. Some concerned anonymous man sent him his last warning, but he ignored it and was hurled into eternity. And our world today is on a collision course with unprecedented catastrophe, but the warnings are being ignored. Multitudes are just too busy with career and pleasure and ambitions to heed the repeated warnings of the Holy Spirit that they're on a collision course with disaster. And like the telegrapher and the Titanic, people have become so focused on the cares of this life that they're ignoring the signs of the time. Many have become frustrated with the message and the messenger. So they, like Jack Phillips, are shutting down the receivers and going to sleep spiritually. But unless they awake now and change course, they'll be startled into reality by an unavoidable catastrophe. But then it will be too late. I'm asking tonight, what are you going to do with the final warnings? In 1889, there was a booming town in western Pennsylvania known as Johnstown. It was located 50 miles downstream from a 450-acre man-made mountain lake. An aging 50-year-old dam made of dirt and rock held the waters of the lake, but it was showing signs of weakening. Johnstown was located 50 miles east of Pittsburgh at the junction of South Creek and Little Connemaw River in a wide mountain valley. In 1889, it had a population of 10,000. At 3.10 p.m. on May the 31st, 1889, after days of heavy rain, the dam broke. And 20 million tons of water roared through the narrow confines of mountain valleys at speeds in excess of 40 miles an hour. A wall of water 70 feet high sent debris, uprooted trees, shattered homes, railroad beds, telephone poles, wooden bridges, and unaccountable tons of soil and rock crashing into the city of Johnstown. Houses and store buildings were turned loose from their foundations and shattered. Over 2,200 people were swept into eternity in just 10 minutes by the angry floodwaters. One third of the dead were identified. Hundreds of missing were never recovered. 15 years later, human remains from the flood were still being found. 99 entire families were wiped out. 396 children under the age of 10 were lost. 98 children lost their parents. 124 women were left widows. 198 men lost their wives. It was one of America's worst tra tragedies. And it didn't have to happen. Ten years before the flood, the owners of the lake knew the dam was in desperate need of repair. But to save money, they hired unqualified workmen and purchased shoddy materials. Inspectors over a period of ten years warned the residents of the city that the dam was in danger of failing. But their repeated warnings were scoffed at and ignored. And every time an inspector came and issued a warning and nothing happened, people became indifferent and calloused. But on the morning of May 31st, 1889, three hours before the dam broke, a young engineer sent an urgent warning by telegraph to immediately evacuate the town because the dam was breaking. He went back and inspected the dam and then sent another telegram, repeated the warnings that the dam was showing signs of collapse and residents should flee. In all, he sent three telegrams. But the telegraph operators in Johnstown viewed the warnings as just another false alarm. Just like people will dismiss this message tonight and say it's just another preacher. It's just another message. But you better hear me tonight. This service, more than likely, is someone's final warning. Those people in Johnstown, they had the attitude, we've heard all of this before. We've heard it for 50 years and nothing has happened and there really isn't anything to worry about. But just minutes before the wall of water came crashing into the town, a young man on horseback, his name was Daniel Periton. He was a son of a town merchant, and he came riding through the streets, yelling, Run for your lives to the hills! Run to the hills! And people came out of stores and houses and thought Daniel had lost his mind. Not a few laughed and joked about his panic-stricken warning. No one took him seriously. But within less than an hour, their laughter was forever silenced and their jokes were replaced with the roar of floodwaters and the cries of the drowning. They could have saved themselves. They had just enough time to escape, but they ignored their final warning. 
In May 2000, a memorial plaque was placed in a grove of trees at the Hofstadt Bluffs Visitor Center near a mountain that was called Mount St. Helens. It contained the names of 57 people who died needlessly when the mountain erupted on May the 18th, 1980. They were loggers, campers, reporters, scientists, and residents of the area who ignored the warnings that the volcano was about to erupt. They were all in the forbidden zones. They had climbed over barricades, ignored posted danger signs, and were overconfident and reckless. The county sheriff stated, quote, people went over and under and through and around every time we tried to restrict access to what we believed were dangerous areas. There were even maps that were sold showing how to get around our blockades on the mountain. But Mount St. Helens awakened from 123 years sleep on March the 20th, 1980, with a 4.1 earthquake. The local news ignored the quake because political news from Washington was considered more important. Seven days later, the first puff of smoke and ash billowed from the summit. Three days later, 79 earthquakes shook the mountain. On April the 3rd, a crater appeared 1,500 feet wide and spewed out explosions of ash, ash and rock and ice. Officials set up red zones and blue zones, and loggers complained that the barricades were interfering with their work. A lot of money was to be made in those lush woods on Mount St. Helens, and it was of little concern to them that the mountain was showing signs of eruption. In late April, a noticeable bulge began to form on the north side of the mountain. Gases and magma were building pressure inside the mountain, and in early May, the bulge grew an astonishing five feet per day. Later in May of that year, the mountain felt silent and the residents of the area who were frustrated and aggravated felt that the disruption of their routine had come to an end and they believed the danger was over. 35 homeowners crashed through the barricades to get to their property. At 8.32 in the morning of Sunday, May the 18th, the mountain blew apart with a force equal to multiple nuclear bombs. Rock, ice, and trees came crashing down the mountain at 500 miles per hour. It was the largest landslide in history. The top 1,300 feet of the mountain came crashing down. Among the victims was David Johnston, who was taking measurements on the morning of May the 18th. He radioed his Vancouver station, Vancouver, Vancouver, this is it. Those were his last words. His body was never found. The waters of Spirit Lake together with the melted snow and ice swept down the mountain at speeds of 175 miles per hour. The water of the lake was instantly heated to over 100 degrees Fahrenheit and in three minutes, three minutes, 230 square miles of forest were flattened. Reed Blackburn, a photographer with a Colombian newspaper was on the scene on that morning the mountain blew. He tried to take refuge in his car but the blast blew out the windows and buried him in hot, choking ash. He was seven miles from the mountain, but he was still too close. And there are so many today who think they're far enough away from sin to escape judgment. Just a little drinking, just a little drugs, just a little sin, not much. But when the catastrophe comes, they too will be destroyed. The soil was heated to an astounding 1,200 degrees. The valley below was buried under 60 feet of pumice and ash. One of the residents of that valley was an elderly man named Harry Truman. He scoffed at the idea that Mount St. Helens could erupt. He said to reporters who presented him with evidence that he was in danger, he said, quote, there's no GD way that the mountain has enough stuff to come my way. He boasted that he had spent most of his life on that mountain with rumors that one day it would explode, but he didn't believe it would ever happen in his lifetime. Just as people now believe the rapture cannot happen in this day and time. But on May the 18th, Mr. Truman was buried under 150 feet of mud and rock. Jack Phillips on the Titanic, the citizens of Johnstown, Harry Truman, Reed Blackburn, and David Johnstown on Mount St. Helens all died because they ignored the last warning. It was on July the 24th, 1986, a Sunday night, in a Sunday night service. I was preaching, the Spirit of God was moving. There were a number of people that were there that were not members of our church. And in the middle of my message, the Holy Spirit of God stopped what I was saying. And I could not believe the words that came out of my mouth. 
I looked at the congregation and said to them, there's someone in this service today. This is your last altar call. This is the last message that you'll ever hear. You'll never receive another invitation to find Jesus as your Savior. I said to them, your casket bearing your lifeless body will soon be rolled down some mortuary in just a few hours' time. And I said, the person who is going to take your life already has their hand on the pistol that's going to end your days. I didn't know it, but a man was visiting his relatives. He had come from Austin, Texas. He and his nephew had had a tremendous disagreement. His nephew was in the parking lot while I was speaking those words with his hand on the pistol waiting for his uncle to come out. His uncle came out, got in the car, drove back to Austin. His nephew followed him all the way and when he disembarked from his car, his nephew aimed his gun, pulled the trigger, and took his life. It was 36 hours from the time that the Spirit of the Lord put those words in my mouth. His niece came to me and knocked on the door and said, Pastor, my uncle that was in that service has just been killed by my brother. Detectives came from Austin, Texas, and they sat in my office, and they said to me, How did you know that that man was soon going to be killed? How did you know that that was his last service? I took my Bible, and I opened it to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and chapter 14 and said, I didn't know who the Lord was speaking to, but there is something called the Word of Wisdom, and the word of knowledge when the Spirit of God will speak through one of His representatives, through one of His servants and notify people that they're in danger. That man that night received his final warning.